the Avon Lady, the dialogue between Franklin and the devotee. Franklin, what is there, devotee? Is there free will? What would you, what would that be? I don't think we have free will. I think only God has free will. And who are we? Part of God? Does God have free will? Then what about evolution? If there is such a thing as evolution, we will all get to God eventually. You are assuming that you are not there for the moment. Well, I am not aware that I am there. That awareness that you are not there is what our work in the ashram is all about. What kind of free will are you concerned with? To do what? Well, if we have free will and there is evolution, why do we have to work at it? Why not let evolution take over and eventually we will all be evolved? into illuminated masters. Are you trying to become a master? I don't think you could leave the plane of existence until you have, until you were a master. What is wrong with this plane of existence? There are other planes to work on. Eventually all attain the state that Christ attained without physical bodies. Where did you hear all this? I don't know. You are making a lot of assumptions to begin with. God, masters, evolution, free will or not, getting there, other planes. What has all of that got to do with you? I am somewhere, but I don't know where. Well, that would seem to be the first order of business. That is just it, isn't it? You are very confused and there is suffering, apparently. You read all these books and you do all this thinking, all this hoping about Christ and whomever else, about getting there and doing this and that to get there. That is suffering. And it is true why go through why go through all this effort to get there i wouldn't use the excuse that we are going to get there anyway because of evolution but there is something very meaningful in this doubt about the whole attempt to get there you have discovered this feeling that the trying to get there is very closely related to suffering there is suffering and there is the trying to get there. Those two things, I would imagine, are very real to you. The conscious suffering involved in life and this whole attempt to get free of it. This whole attempt to get free of it is very elaborate, very involved notion. You have to do so many things before you get there. There is all of this stuff which doesn't do one thing to your suffering. The concept of Jesus doesn't do anything for your suffering. The idea of becoming like Jesus doesn't do anything for your suffering. The effort to become like Jesus doesn't do anything for your fundamental suffering. Your constant evolution to become like Jesus doesn't do anything for your continuous suffering. Suffering persists as the basic content of your consciousness. On top of that, there is all of this seeking, wondering, thinking about how to get there, how to get free of suffering. If you were already free of suffering, it wouldn't make any difference to you whether this room appeared or a ballroom in Vienna, or a seventh plane party. 
The fact that suffering is gone would be the thing that makes you happy. When suffering no longer distracts you, you see that you are already happy, that you are happiness. From the purely practical and real point of view, the thing that concerns you is not other planes, God, Jesus, or getting there. Suffering is your concern because it is already your real experience. Devotee, it seems to me if you look at any realised man, you see how far you can go. Franklin, how do you know how far you have to go? How do you know where he is? Devotee, well, I'm still suffering, so I still have a long way to go. If I am not in a perfect state of living, if I am not here now, then I am separate. <coughs> what is this suffering? Well, there are different forms of suffering. Not being realised is suffering. What is it right now, as a perception, right now? What is this suffering? Being trapped in the human body? What is there about that that is suffering? I don't want to be in it. Are you in it? Now I am, yes. What makes you think you are something that could be inside the body? Well, that is the way I feel now, since I assume it now, it's real now. Your assumption makes it real? Yes. Is your assumption that the thing you are suffering? Well, you could say that, yes. That which is called realisation, liberation, God, union, or whatever, gets represented to people in various symbolic ways, as a path, as something with lots of planes and worlds, colours, lights and visions, figures and forms, methods, universes, inside and outside, going here, going there, distance, direction, shape. These are all conceptual communications, symbols, pictures for the mind. Fundamentally, they exploit your suffering by motivating you to acquire whatever it is they represent or hide. True spiritual life is not a motivation to these symbols, a belief in them, nor even the acquisition of what they represent. Spiritual life is the process in consciousness in which there is understanding or recognition of suffering, the present experience. Where there is no suffering, that which stands out or becomes the obvious is called heaven, nirvana, liberation, the self, Brahman, God, God, union, truth, reality. When there is no dilemma, when there is no formation of consciousness, when consciousness itself ceases to take on form or become identical to form, this is what is called liberation. The process that is involved is not one of search based on suffering. Ordinarily, if you suffer, you immediately seek to get free and you attach yourself to all kinds of hopeful signs. But true life or spiritual life is the reverse of that. Ordinarily, a man is seeking, pursuing forgetfulness from the, his suffering, his dilemma, his contraction, this separation, this unconsciousness. He pursues the absence of that in delight, enjoyment, distraction, search for perfection, search for all kinds of acquisitions, food, sex, money, good weather, lunch, until this whole process begins to, be, to become uninteresting. He tries every resort, either by contemplation or actual adventure. He looks at every movie on the subject. He seeks until that whole movement in him the whole reaction to his suffering, which is the search for the absence of suffering, begins to wind down. Now he begins to realise his hopelessness. The search begins to lose its capacity to occupy him. 
it becomes less exotic, less fascination, less fascinating, less hopeful. Some quality in consciousness begins to turn away from this whole process of seeking, this whole reaction to his suffering, and rests in the suffering itself. He is no longer reciting his mantra, stretching into holy shapes, thinking about long ago Jesus, wanting to be in the seventh plane, concentrating on a spot on the wall to get out of the body. He is no longer really interested in any of that. Even a vague disinterest in life's pleasure may come over him. He begins to realise that he's, he is actually suffering, whereas before he was completely occupied with his seeking and suffering wasn't really the object of his contemplation. It was just some vague whatever. The search was what involved him, but now he begins to fall out of his search. He begins to live this suffering. Suffering becomes his acquisition, his experience, his obsession. It completely absorbs him. It becomes the object of his meditation. His actual state becomes absorbing. This rather than all the things to which he attached himself to forget it, this, to get rid of this. Then he begins to see his suffering, to recognise his suffering. He begins to see, in fact, what his suffering is. That subtle sensation that is motivating his work, his whole search, becomes the thing that occupies him. He can no longer do anything about it. He sees what suffering about itself is at this moment. He begins to see it precisely. It is present activity. He begins to recognise it, to know it again in consciousness. He sees this contraction of his own state, moment to moment, this separation, this avoidance of relationship. He begins to see this more and more exactly, specifically. It becomes an overwhelming recognition until that portion of himself, that quality of himself, that enjoys the recognition, that is the intelligence of this recognition of suffering, becomes his intelligence, becomes the very quality of consciousness that he lives, with which he approaches all experience moment to moment. Then, instead of simply suffering, he inquires of the nature of this experiencing, moment to moment. He sees beyond this contraction that is his suffering and he begins to enjoy that which his chronic activity and state always prevent. Our suffering is our own activity. It is something that we are doing moment to moment. It is completely voluntary. It is a completely voluntary activity. We recognise it in the form of symptoms, which are the sense of separate existence, the mind of endless qualities of differentiation and the whole form of motion of desire. We are always already living in these things, but their root, the source of it all, the thing whose form they are all reflecting, is this contraction, this separative act, this avoidance of relationship, which constantly creates the form in consciousness that we cognize as suffering. Where it is recognized, known again, this activity and its symptoms cease to be the form of consciousness. Then what is always prevented by the usual state becomes the form of consciousness. Where there is unqualified relationship, where there is no contraction, where there is no separation, no avoidance, there is no differentiation, no necessary mind, no necessary desire, no identification with a separate moment. Then consciousness falls into its own form without effort. Symbolically, this is called knowing or cognizing the self. But in fact, it is not possible to fix attention on the self. Your own reality or reality itself cannot become an object of attention. The actual process involves attention and recognition of this suffering, this contraction. Where suffering is thus known, what it prevents is suddenly, spontaneously enjoyed, not as the object of enjoyment, but as the enjoyment itself. Then prior to effort, motivation or attention, there is only the self, reality, the heart. Where there is this recognition of suffering, 
the whole structure of experiences, concepts, searches, strategies that is our ordinary life, our search ceases to be obsessive or even particularly interesting. It loses its, its significance, its capacity to love. Truth is love. Reality is love. This is love. This love has nothing to do with images of some cosmic super guy. Truth is love. We are love. This is love. Devotee, what about Jesus freaks and other people who go through a sudden change and become very light and happy? Frankly, we would of course have to be talking about somebody in particular to make much sense out of it. There are all kinds of testimonials, all kinds of salvations and all kinds of claims made by people. There are thousands of religious and philosophical methods that have been tried by human beings and all of them have a certain amount of success. There are always a few individuals who make great claims for some particular way. Christianity is one for which we have many such testimonials because it, because it has been going on for a long time and many, many people have tried some form of it. There have been a number of great men and women among the Christians. There have also been a lot of mediocre people. Some of those mediocre people have also enjoyed a revolutionary change in their state for reasons that others find hard to understand. Many other people have claimed to have gone through the Enlightenment experience with various Zen masters or whatever. The Christian experience is typically holy, but the Zen experience is typically ordinary. The Zen insight may be precipitated by a punch in the mouth, a smack on the head with an oar, or some crazy thing, and the next moment the smacky claims to be entirely transformed, living from an entirely new point of view. So this spontaneous turning around can take place under all kinds of apparent circumstances. Enthusiastic claims are not exclusive to Christianity. They are found in all religious and spiritual traditions. The phenomenon of change is itself the essential or common factor in all of them. And in general, they are hard to understand on the face of it. If you took a survey of all religions and religious and spiritual claims and tried to make sense of them, you wouldn't be able to isolate something that occurred internally or externally that could justify the claims. And that is precisely the point. In this turnabout, which can appear dramatic or not, nothing is added. Its reasons are not identifiable, because it is not a matter of attaching something to the person's life, externally or internally. It is a matter of a turnabout of consciousness itself. One of the things the great traditional teachers have tried to communicate is the value of that turnabout, and also something about how it actually takes place. If you took a survey of all the apparent examples of this turnabout, you couldn't make sense out of it. So the historical masters, gurus or teachers, have always tried to communicate that process itself by whatever particular means they had available to them. For the most part, though, the experiences to which religious, religious people testify represent exact except in relatively few cases, an emotional and temporary distraction, a kind of mood. It is an experience. It can be described. It can be held onto and it can be lost. It can even be proclaimed that what is called enlightenment, liberation or guard union in its true sense is profoundly unlike experience. Truth is not an experience. It is not a particular state, and it cannot be identified with a particular way of life, a particular appearance. Seekers of all kinds talk about dramatic events in their lives as if they were this enlightenment of truth. But most of these events are forms of temporary distraction. They are only intense experiences, and men want to hold on to such things. They want to preserve or repeat them throughout life and look forward to the repetition of them in heaven or after life. But truth rests 
are no experience whatsoever. It is not in itself an experience. It cannot be held on to. It cannot be repeated. It cannot be looked forward to. It cannot be lost. It cannot even be recommended. It is an absolute obliteration of what we commonly call life. What is ordinarily called salvation is a form of satisfac satisfaction imagined by a separate, fearful man. When a man is saved, his separate life is consoled, distracted and involved with a path, an image, an experience. But when there is nothing to be satisfied, when there is no one to be satisfied, when there is no one to give a testimony, when there is no one to meet Jesus, that is liberation. When the ego, the separate self-sense that is our suffering, is undermined and there is a sudden or prolonged penetration of the structure of consciousness, of mind, of motion, of self-sense, when all of that is undermined, penetrated, understood, recognized, and the very thing that it prevents is, is enjoyed, there is no longer anyone to survive his death. Then there is no separate one living. There is no one to be in a body. There is no one to be out of the body. Nothing has happened. There is no separate one. Devotee, if we are already conscious, then we are not in this ashram to become conscious, right? Franklin, what you think is consciousness is not consciousness itself. It is a form in consciousness. So we are separating ourselves. We are identifying with the form instead of consciousness. But there is no method to be recommended to go and find that consciousness. Ramana Maharshi spoke about a method but his way is really quite paradoxical, humorous, and not, as it seems, straightforward. If you remember, he was always saying, find out who it is that has experiences, that wants to seek, that thinks it is in the body. Find out who that is. But of course, there is no way to find that out. There is no one to find that out. It is a spontaneous event, a paradoxical event, the most absolute of all events. It is a gift. It is itself God, truth, reality. <laughs> the highest responsibility of men is satsang, to live in the condition of relationship, the condition of the heart, the company of the self, the guru. The essential responsibility of the guru is satsang, to live the heart to his friends. The highest responsibility of those who live this satsang is to make it available to others. So this ashram involves satsang, living company, a continuous relationship as the condition of life. It is the one thing done. Nothing else is exchanged. No special techniques, no thing. None of this seeking is exploited. The essential work of those who are responsible for the ashram is to make satsang available to others. Everything else is secondary. Everything that serves the availability of satsang is the responsibility of this ashram. There is a danger in all associations of men because we appear within the human condition, this dream world. Men tend to live from the point of view of this condition. There is an ancient ritual that men unconsciously desire to re-enact. Wherever you see an association of men gathered for the purpose of spiritual life, the same thing is tending to be created. There is an ancient game called scapegoat. There is an ancient ritual called the round dance. Men tend to encircle the centre, a book, a man, a symbol, a guru. They tend to encircle him and inquire all things for this circle. The group becomes inward directed. It becomes occult. Anciently, the highest product of this cult is the sacrifice of the one in the middle. Traditional societies throughout the ancient world did this yearly. The guy in the middle was killed or richly disposed and a new guy was installed in the centre. The execution of Jesus is, is an example of this same ritual. The addition of this ancient ritual process makes the death of Jesus into the sacrifice of Christ. In the New Testament you read how the soldiers tortured Jesus. They played the game, this game called scapegoat. It is a game of man in the middle. 
The tendency of those who become involved in spiritual work is to create a cult, a circle that ever increases its dimensions and its content, beginning from this centre, surrounding it, ultimately destroying it. The form that the cult or spiritual association of men tends to take is the same form that men are living individually. It is self or ego in the middle. It is this avoidance of relationship, this contraction, which creates a sense of mind, the endless habits of desire. It is what we call life. A man begins to sense this separate existence to be his very nature and spends his life creating a circle of content or acquisition all around it. He encloses all other things he can acquire, all of the things he can acquire, all of the states and thoughts he can acquire, all the emblems, symbols, experiences, sensations. When he begins to involve himself in some spiritual association, or for that matter, any association outside his own subjectivity, he tends again to create that same circle about a centre. The cult is a reenactment of the ego. The ultimate fate of every cult is the same as that of the ego, the separate and separate of self. It is the sacrificial destruction of the centre, the death of the one in the middle. The true satsang is an anti-cultic or non-cultic process. It is not inward directed. It doesn't tend to become a cult in the sense I have described. It is inclusive, but the centre is not its motive. In satsang, the centre is always already undermined as a centre, as a separate and separative entity. The centre of satsang is consciousness itself. It is the light, the very force of unqualified consciousness. It is communicated directly to a man's life in relationship so that he no longer needs to turn inward to create survival of a centre. Instead, he turns toward function, freely the light already assumed. So satsang, the company of truth, tends to serve life, to move into life, to contact life in relationship, not to acquire life. My intention with men is not in, not to absorb them into a society or spiritual gang with which they are to become symbolically and ritually preoccupied. I would bring them the force of consciousness whereby they can become capable of life. I demand a functional capacity of men. I do not require it to be eliminated, resisted or escaped through some phony meditative impulse. I require the functions of men to live. I do not require the separation from virtual life, virtual enjoyment, existence in the form of life. I require these functions to be known, to be understood, to be lived from the point of view of truth. Such is the genuine effect of satsang, the accompanying mood of satsang. It is one of capacity for relationship, of no search, of dilemma. It is not the tendency to some other state. It is the obviation of the dilemma within the present state, the undermining of it. One who understands and whose life is lived as the condition of satsang is not necessarily, in his appearance, different from any other man. He hasn't necessarily acquired some psychic abilities, visionary abilities, whatever. Understanding is not itself the acquisition of some particular experience. He might, by tendency, by reason of his tendencies, experience the arising of extraordinary abilities, but not necessarily. He becomes, like the guru, one who is simply awake within the, the dream. Satsang is a natural process in which the contraction that is our suffering is operated upon by the guru. The disciple is preoccupied with his search, but all the while the guru is acting upon his fundamental motivating dilemma and strategy. And there are two tendencies by which the guru is always being confronted by his disciple. One is the tendency to seek rather than to enjoy the condition of satsang. And the other is the tendency to create this contracting circle, this cult, this ritual of fascination and unconsciousness. The guru has only one resort in either case. It is satsang, his simple relationship to his friends. Devotee, 
are all awakened men gurus? Franklin, no, guru is not a kind of status. It is a specific function. There are some who awaken, but who simply live without becoming active as the function of guru. There are others who awaken and do, in fact, perform that function. Truth, not the role of guru, is the enjoyment of all who are awake. Devotee, it's hard to figure out what I have read. One realised man wiped out his father, another curled off his whole family. How can such phenomena be explained? Franklin, there is a point where one's search becomes inappropriate. This is that point. All of the scriptures a person reads, all of the remarks and experiences and traditions come to an end when the import of those scriptures ceases to be academic. In the presence of the heart, seeking is inappropriate. It makes no difference what those sentences meant. That's not the point. The universe devours billions upon billions of entities every moment, every second. If we were to judge by actions, those to whom enlightenment should go, the universe itself would be the last. If we were to judge by actions, those to whom enlightenment should go, the universe itself would be the last. Only the righteous fools within it would be enlightened, but the universe would have to wait until the very end on account of its crimes. It is not any kind of significance, any appearance, any suggestion, any implication of what we see that is the truth. The traditions say that you can't find the guru in his actions. In other words, it is not by watching how various people act and speak that you find the guru. He is always a paradox. His action is a paradox like the universe itself. The old texts that talk about realised beings killing others are allegories for spiritual transformations within a man. One of the classic statements of Vedanta is that once a man has realised the self, he could slay a Brahmin and it would not be a sin for him. It wouldn't affect him. All of these statements are simply suggesting or somehow trying to imply the freedom of the Janani, Janani the self-realised man. So it is that self, that reality to which these scriptures are trying to turn you. If you miss the point and the self doesn't become your direction after reading such scriptures, you are stuck with something you can't understand. You are stuck with something that seems to say what can't be true. So all of these old scriptures are loaded. There are always two sides but they only have one purpose, which is to create interest in the truth, in realisation. Out of the interest has been created, the scriptures have served their purpose. They just serve to move you along and entertain you for a period of time until this whole possibility becomes significant, significant enough that a crisis, a breakdown in your ordinary functioning, begins to take place. And hopefully, when this crisis begins, you will also find yourself in the company of a truly self-realised man, one who lives as a self. When that contact is made, all of these suggestive, suggestive sentences become obsolete. They lose their function at the point where that meeting takes place. The more you have accumulated before that moment, the more there is that becomes obsolete, and so also the more resistance there is. Truly, the self is mad, the self is unlearned. <clears throat> the appropriate foundation of human life is not an entity, a separate self sent, an ego, such as even a soul. Such is not the appropriate foundation for human life. The appropriate foundation for human life is the heart, the self. It is utterly mindless, utterly free, uncontained, unqualified. But paradoxically, when the heart is lived, the human being becomes functional, usable, alive, moved. Such a one makes no complicated use of the things an ordinary man uses to survive. Like a child, he moves by delight. He is a man of pleasure, of enjoyment, like a madman. He learns nothing from life. He doesn't believe what he sees. He doesn't take it to have any limited significance. 
he throws away all the things that seem to everyone so profound, so serious. He attributes nothing to them. So the realised man is like a madman and a child. But apart from actual realisation, radical understanding, what I have just said is a form of entertainment. It doesn't affect your impending death, and your death is what interests the guru. Devotee, what about Lord Yama, the king of death? Frankly, Lord Yama, the storybook Lord of Death, he barely enters into it. He is only a symbol in consciousness, as if death were some entity, some being or other. But your death is your concern. It is not the concern of any other. That other is yourself. So it is only the true guru who is very, who is very interested in your death. Your death, not all the things you call your life. And he is very interested in bringing it about very quickly. He doesn't want a long engagement. He wants a sudden death for everyone. What if a guy's heart, breath and mind were suspended for 20 minutes? He'd be free then, wouldn't he? Frankly. It depends on what has occurred during those 20 minutes. Many people have been in a coma for months or even years, but they don't, but they don't, didn't wake up any less immune to death or any more intelligent. The death I am talking about is not the death of which you suspect yourself. It is not simply that physical, that vital event. The death I am talking about is the turnabout, the dissolution of the principle by which you live, the fundamental activity that you are animating, dramatizing, considering to be yourself, living to others, your state. It is that death which is significant. Devotee, sir, would you like to compare that with, say, the physical side of suicide? Frankly, the physical act of suicide is an impairment. It is an obstruction. It takes away from you the functions you have available for intelligence. So the mere act of suicide is not it, any more than extreme fasting, self-immolation, deprivation of the senses, exclusive internal concentration. None of these psychophysical events is the crisis of truth. They are all experiences. They are symbolic at best. They don't achieve the thing that is needed. We have talked about traditional yogic methods of seeking self-realization or guard union. They are something like sitting in a room, breathing heavily and looking at erotic pictures. You, are generated, you can generate something that is like passion, but you are never going to make love. It never becomes that. Just so, you can sit and breathe methodically, turning inward, contemplating divine images or God ideas, but it is never going to become God union. God has never entered into it. It is a very hopeful practice at best. There is no God union until God is there to be unioned with. As the lover depends on his loved one, the God seeker depends on the living presence of God before there can be any God union. And when God appears, you are not going to have you are not going to have to do your spiritual breathing. It will all be very obvious. You won't have to think about what is necessary to be done to become one with God. It is only the absence of God, the suffering, the ignorant condition that gets you involved in all of this seeking. It is only where God al is already, not that all of these practices begin. Devotee well, sh should we just wait it out until God comes then? Like waiting for God or something? Frankly, this deliberate waiting is also another form of the same seeking. Fortunately or unfortunately, the search goes on in spite of you until this connection is made. Everything you do is that search until God, the self, the heart enters into the picture as a reality in relationship. Devotee. If consciousness is divided between waking, dreaming and deep sleep, then how do we get behind these three to find the self? Franklin, that has been the mysterious approach of Advaita Vedanta, of Yana Yoga and other traditions of spiritual practice. 
They build up this conceptual dilemma and then they try to solve it. So the self is pictured as an alternative to waking, dreaming and sleeping. The self is pictured or proposed as a something else, another state that is hidden beneath the usual three. It is hardly in the waking state, barely in the dreaming state, only implied in the sleeping state. Thus, in order to get underneath all of this, it appears that you must go through a subtle process of internalization, which is traditional meditation. For a while you try to go inward, then you open your eyes again, and at the same time you are looking at this, the appearing world, you are trying to concentrate on an internal one that is not really in this one. So there is all this interior and out here at the same time. You go crazy after a while. The Hindu formula is not complete as spoken. The central formula of the ancients, as stated by the Hindus, is the Jivamat, the Jivatman, the individual soul, the Paramatman, Atman, the Jivatman, <laughs> the great soul, the universal soul, are one. Therefore, seekers in that tradition are led into a process of interiorization and union. The formula of Buddhism, the classical tradition, might well be added to this. It is stated in the form Nirvana and Samsara are the same. In other words, the great self, the unqualified reality, is not different from this, the conditional appearance, the world. When taken together, these two reflect something in a symbolic way of the nature of reality. This, the entire force and form, the intensity arising as this moment, is the self. It is not that there is some hidden being underneath the three states that is the self of all of this. It's just sort of hanging around on it. There is no distinction whatsoever in consciousness. There is always already no dilemma. There is no inwardness that is equal to the truth. There is no special subjectivity that is the truth itself. There is no special objectivity that is the truth itself. But the subjective and the objective are already the very thing, the very truth. Even so, there is a dilemma meanwhile. There is suffering, non-comprehension as that simplicity. And since there is suffering, men are motivated to recover the sublimity they have been suggesting to themselves and which some men have claimed to have enjoyed. But, is it, but it is only when the whole process of interior and exterior, all these movements, all these searches, all these experiences, when all of that has failed, then suffering itself becomes the point, because it becomes the experience, rather than all of the seeking that is only a reaction to it. Then the man falls into his suffering, dies from his suffering, becomes conscious of his suffering, understands his suffering, and sees what is already the case. So all the seeking is just a prolongation of the suffering. Devotee, when the realized man has turned the switch off, how does he get to function back in, in this world? Franklin, the self is not behind all of this. The self is this without a doubt. There is no separation whatsoever. Therefore, self-realization is perfectly compatible with human existence. The truly self-realized man is no longer suffering, no longer inward, no longer outward. The dilemma is gone. He sees, he sees the obvious. He enjoys the obvious. And all the human functions become functions, in fact, usable, realizable and enjoyable. You are dealing with images. These images imply things about your present state that are not quite true. They are metaphors, the idea of the switch, the idea of the fourth state beyond the three states. Truth has been represented in the form of images to interest you in realization, to suggest to you what is not realization. But realization is of another kind than this interest, this fascination developed by means of the texts. Thus, all of the traditions agree that the best thing a man can do is spend his time in satsang, in the company of the realized man, the guru. That is meditation, that is the real condition, that is realization, that is perfect enjoyment. Devotee, how can that affect you, just sitting with such a person? 
Franklin. A man tends to take on the qualities of the things he spends his time with. If you watch a television program or a movie, you go through a distracting drama, then all of a sudden a commercial. It breaks at a whole trance, so you feel disturbed. If you spend your evening in a topless bottomless bar, another game attracts you. If you take drugs, there is that number. If you get amused tonight, smoking cigarettes until dawn, there is that whole form of mind and life. Perhaps you go on a picnic, fishing, or to church on Sunday. There are all these dramas being played. Now it appears that in the ordinary drama, in all of its millions of forms, and in all the millions of people living it, there is a contraction. Every drama is a play of separation, of suffering, of seeking. The contraction is its subtlest element, its foundation. So that when you become involved with all ordinary things, regardless of what they appear to be at this moment, they carry with them the subtle implication of your suffering. Now there is this pleasure, now this, now this entertainment, and now this one. The appearance varies, but it is always the same. The same implication, the same thing by association is being reinforced in consciousness. But man of understanding, the guru, doesn't appear to be any different, essentially any different. There is no standout on his la the pal thing, obviousness about it. There is no standout on his the pal thing, obviousness about it. But he lives as the self, thus, of all your associations, it is this company that does not support this contraction. It does not support it. That is what there, what is unique about it. You continue to attempt to live this contraction in various ways. You continue to be entertained. You continue to seek. You even continue to expect what it looks like you should expect from that association. But the guru does not support the contraction, the very suffering. The guru is like an elevator. He's in the hotel lobby with a nice marble casement and a needle above pointing to the numbers of floors. It looks perfectly stable. You know it has been there for a while. You dare to walk up to it. You see buttons on the wall. The doors open. You look inside. It is nicely decorated. A couple of people nicely dressed come out to go to the cocktail lounge. So you step in. You expect to rise, as all the traditions say. But you fall right through the bottom of the floor. He doesn't support it, but he appears ordinary. His activity is non-support in endless subtle forms. The effect of this non-support is that the quality of contraction in you begins to become self-conscious. The search winds down, the suffering becomes self-conscious, and intuitively you become alive within it. This quality of contraction simply begins to get flabby and fall apart. You begin to recognise it, to know it again. Therefore, in that living association or relationship with the guru, the self, is lived to you, whereas in all other conditions, it is this contraction, the avoidance of relationship, that is lived to you. Devotee, would you describe some of the levels on which the guru operates? Franklin, there is no particular point in describing them. The most it would do is make you self-conscious and wary. On every level that, con- that awareness is possible, the heart is active. The important thing is that even though men are suffering, they intuit- intuitively recognise the living self. What they will do about that is another matter, but the recognition is there in some intuitive form. Rather than any other kind of information, it is upon that recognition that disciples and devotees must depend, both for the knowing whether the man is guru and for the knowing whether he wants, he himself wants to be involved in that kind of relationship. Many have had enough, so that once they see the guru, they stay to live with the guru. Through that process, they begin to see how the guru, the living heart, operates. Others come, and they resist immediately, and they defend their state, and so they leave. The concern of the, of the disciple is the relationship to his guru, which is satsang. Sitting with his guru is this meditation. It contains all of the elements of meditation. Sitting in relationship with the self. Consciously sitting in relationship with the self or God-nature. What else could meditation be? 
So it is simply sitting or living aware of that. And it becomes more profound, more subtle. It becomes intelligence. It becomes self-inquiry. It perhaps becomes something formal looking to some degree, appearing as what we ordinarily think to be meditation. But that sitting, that relationship to the guru, satsang, sitting, living it from day to day, living the conditions this relationship creates for you, this is spiritual life, it is meditation, it is spiritual effort, sadhana. And on top of that, there is entertainment, because life is an entertainment. There is as much entertainment in that relationship as any other. There is a humour to it, but the entertainment is utterly enjoyable. That relationship is humour. It is obvious, because the most fundamental enjoyment is always taking place. Until a man recognises the heart alive and lives that relationship, everything he does is a form of his search. Every action reinforces his suffering. It is not it. There must be a radically new life, a radically new presence, a radically new communication. The heart itself must appear, otherwise the seeker is like the guy with the girly magazine in his room. He is not going to make it, and all the spiritual books have no more ultimate significance than pornography for such a one. All of the seeker's spiritual reading is perhaps a little subtler than erotica, but the same motivation is behind it, the same suffering is there. It is a form of entertainment. On different days there are different kinds of entertainment. Some days you prefer girly magazines, other days you prefer the Bhagavad Gita. But it is the same guy, the same search, the same dilemma. This is why certain Zen masters burned the traditional sculptured images of the Buddha. The same thing must be done for the scriptures. It is not necessary to go out and burn them in the street, but there must be this understanding of their significance in relation to the heart, the true spiritual life. The intelligence of the heart is a genius, a fire, not a little pipe-smoking philosopher. The same power that wields this universe and devours the billions of beings in, is the heart. One who lives as the heart can read these scriptures and use them, consume them, destroy them, play with them, do whatever he likes with them. Such a confrontation with the scriptures is alive, but the seeker's confrontation with the scriptures is mediocre. It doesn't amount to God union. It is only one that is already realised who reads such things and comprehends them. For the man who does not understand the books are simply ways of gaining his interest, moving him toward a moment when he will seriously begin. And even then, there are many pitfalls. The guy puts down the girly magazine, gets dressed and goes out to a pornographic movie house. This instead of going out to find himself a human company in relationship. So it takes more than just putting down the books. There are lots of gurus around, lots of movie houses where you go in for a zapping. They entertain you, they take a couple of bucks, they do a number for you. It's in sound and colour, two full hours. And what does it come down to? They tell you to go home and do it yourself. You were home trying to do it yourself all night, but now they give you a, a Harry Umpty Ump mantra. You take it on home and you clean up the corner of your bedroom. You throw away all away the you throw away all the girly magazines, or at least you keep them in the bathroom under the hamper. You clean up the corner of the room and you open up the blinds so that the sun comes in on it really nice. Then you get up at dawn and you say, Harry umpty ump, Harry umpty ump. Such an oh you might sing it, Harry umpty ump, Harry umpty ump. Such a man is in the same condition that he was the night before, even less intelligent. He has taken on some path or other, professionalised his search. The night before, he was just a guy, just a slob, but now he's a yogi. He puts on the outfit, wears the beads on his hand, starts collecting money for his trip to India next year. He does this number for however long it takes him to get sick of it, sick of it all. And after that, he says the hell with it. He messes up his room again. He throws away his robe and beads. He takes the girly magazines back into the bedroom. But he really hasn't got it anymore. Besides, he is probably 50 years old by now. So he is really not about to go back out to the girly show. 
His girly magazines aren't really going to give it to him either. Then all of a sudden the doorbell rings. It's the Avon lady. Avon? Avon calling? Better known as the guru. In the building in which our ashram is presently housed, we have the movie house, our bookstore, out in the front, with all of the best traditional literature, the very best pornography. In other words, we don't carry any junk. People who have become interested, who have left their homes, who are wandering around trying to find something a little jazzier, who have, who have done little reading, these people see the bookstore. All of the traditional motivations gather them up and they come in to look at the books. While they browse, they see a couple of signs about our spiritual centre and after a while they begin to feel a little itching in the back of their heads. So it is a very unusual movie house. It appears like any other one. It appears ordinary. It is ordinary. The ordinary, from the point of view of consciousness, is the only extraordinary. All the extraordinaries to which men aspire are very ordinary. They have been done thousands upon thousands of times. All of the careers of spontaneous physical movements that arise when the internal spiritually force is activated in the yogi. All of the subtle movements, all of the purifications, all of the visions, they have all been done thousands upon thousands of times. Everything has been done. All of these realizations have occurred. The internal mechanism of man has been exploited and explored for eons. It is not a new medium at all. Therefore, all the ordinary aspirations based on suffering and seeking lead to the ordinary, the mediocre, the usual, more of the same. The man having an ecstatic vision is in the same condition as the man watching a TV commercial. Only when all of that is worn down does the man begin to see that the principle of his seeking, his discovery, his realization is suffering. That's the truth. Then he begins to become sensitive to his actual condition instead of trying to do something about it. He sees exactly what it is. That is when the extraordinary living thing occurs. When it begins, there is an unseriousness about all the things that he took seriously before. All the accumulations, the imagery, the books, all the symbols cease to be his occupation. He becomes occupied with the living condition and it precedes all of this mentality.